Welcome, guys. This is uh, John Z, and we are uh, episode 72 of Tales from the Flip Side, presented by CBSI, uh, comicbookinvest.com. Um, your source for all your uh, speculation and comic needs. So, welcome. And uh, sorry, my uh, mic was muted, so I'm going to probably redo that. Oh, we heard you. We heard you. Okay. I heard you. All right. And uh, with me this week, I have Paul because uh, I think everybody else is worn out from Heroes Con. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, happy to be here. Look like we're, uh, sounds like we're going to do um, uh, foreign variants. 2.0. So we, we are arranged a uh, a ragtag expert squad of uh, people. Matthew Roybal <laughs> is joining us again. What's up, guys? He, our, uh, our, our resident uh, blowing our minds from last episode. We've also uh, invited Robert Fordham, who uh, got bit by the foreign bug after our last podcast to talk about his experiences. What's going on, guys? Hailing from Maryland. Right out here with Brian's Brian Wood. He's on the other end of Maryland, but I'm at the top end. But I'm yeah. here too. <laughs> so he's going to talk sure. about all his uh, fun. And then we also brought in uh, Tim Bildhauser, the CBC, CBCS International Comics Specialist, to uh, talk about uh, his experiences and, and throw some knowledge at us. How's it going, guys? <laughs> What's up, Tim? What's going on, Tim? For the record, anybody that says they're too tired from being at Heroes Con is just making excuses because I just got back myself. <laughs> what, like three hours ago, you said? Pretty much. Yeah. You know, guys are, guys are wusses. What are we going to say? Dino, Dino wore out his voice, I'm sure, or he's playing with his cats. Those millennials need their sleep. <laughs> Damn kid. Millennial. I, I am sorry, the YouTube watchers, we may have a few less cat entertainment videos than normal, so... Uh, We'll go from there. Um, I guess we'll skip pickups because uh, it's just me and Paul. I don't think you have anything to show, Paul. I, I do. I have one. Um, I don't know. I've been looking at it raw. I've never owned a raw, so I, I was watching this auction, and so I, I probably think I paid GPA, uh, but I don't care. It's cool. Signed by Jim Lee, the Solson Christmas Special Number One. Oh, uh, I got it in a nine-two. Cool. All right, grade, but you know. Whatever, it's all good. The hold on with that the the Samurai Santa. Yeah, yeah. Add it to my, my, cool. my Christmas books. So. The, that's for Jim Lee's first work, right? Or mm -hmm. Pro work. Yeah, Andy signed it, so it was good. That's a nice book. Awesome, Congrats, sir. Yeah, thanks. I didn't, you know, grades all right, nine two, but I mean it's from eighty six, so that's a tough book. I'm betting to find. Uh, yeah, all, I mean, all black, all black front. Yeah. And then all white back. So, I mean, you got, you yeah, got I mean, things going against you. So, if, even if you find a nice stack of them, somebody probably, uh, the, the blacks rubbed on the white there. Yeah. You're right. Right. So, that's that's all I had. All right. Well, I'll share a couple right. since we, we we got time to kill and only three of us. Or I got some us. pickups too, foreign pickups. Well, we'll let you go uh, second. I have two non foreigns, but they are obscure. So, that gets me some credit. I uh, picked up, sorry, picked up um, a Golden Age first appearance. Green Lantern number ten. Oh, nice! First Vandal Savage. Um, he's not big in the uh, the live action world, but man, if you watch the animated world, he pops up a lot. He was in the uh, Suicide Squad animated movie recently. He's uh, one of the main antagonists in the Young Justice, so. Uh, he was in uh, um, Legends of Tomorrow, so he he pops up now and again, and I just love the cover, the the red, the deep red color, um, almost got a Wolfman vibe. And, what uh, year was that? This one was 1943, so pretty early on in the Golden Age. Nice. So I I missed picking one up probably five years ago, and I haven't had a chance to since. So I jumped on it when I could. That's always been a tougher book to find. Uh, yeah. I mean, I literally, I've been looking and I just don't see him. So, and then one other one going with the Wolfman vibe, probably the ugliest Wolfman in history. Um, <laughs> Adventures into the Unknown, 
number 36. Um, honestly, I picked this one up on Comic Link because it is an Edgar Church Mile High copy. It's only a 6.0, which is pretty low grade for for that. Uh, honestly, not sure why. I haven't really got into the weeds with it. It doesn't look quite as bad as they graded. It does have a little bit of writing on it, but uh, I had an Edgar Church, and I got rid of it, and I've regretted it, so this was a, a cheap buyback into getting a copy. Nice. You know, a lot of the church mile, copies have... You can get a cheap mile high, it's worth it. What's that, Tim? A lot of the church copies have, have writing on them. Um, that's one of the ways that they can be easily identified. Thank you, sir. See, we've already got, got some expertise coming in. <laughs> I mean, so I'm going to search I've books like only history, man. What, what, what kind of writing do they have? Is it just a same kind of thing on all of them, or is it uh, a variable? It's, it's some kind of notation he was putting on them. I don't know if it was like a cataloging system. Um, Wes Stefan that, that works at CBCS knows pedigrees inside now for the most part. Um, he would be able to explain it far better than I would. Huh. I'm going to have to look. I'm going to check my pictures out from my old one, but I that do Borak, recall some kind of writing on it as well. Yeah, that, that Borak guy might know something about that stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, huh? All right, awesome. I'm going to turn it over to Matt so he can present some of his stuff here. Hold on just a second. There you go, sir. Cool. Um, so I, I actually hadn't been buying a whole lot lately, but I did get out of Mexico this bound book. And the reason I got it is because of these bad boys right here. Now... I mean, it's this classic Wrightson. I've been wanting one of these Swamp Thing ones, these Migran Aventuras, for a very, very long time. But I, they just don't pop up like they used to. And honestly, uh, even though these have been trimmed and the spines are destroyed, sometimes during the binding process, the spine, uh, the, the binder would actually leave the spine somewhat intact. So you can sometimes find books that have been pulled from buying that still have somewhat of a spine on them. These are not, they're completely loose leafed, which Why did you pull them out of the bind? I didn't pull them out of the bind. They, they had been pulled out of the bind already. I don't know if the guy that was selling them just thought that, that they would be worth more that way. Did he I don't send know. you the bind itself too? Yeah, here it is right here. Maybe he was hoping they were still stuck on it, huh? Uh, no, I think he knew. He just, you know. Oh, he just I, pulled out the first two. No, I did. This is the thing. They're loose-leafed. Huh. Wow. So. They probably could, trimmed the spine and the other three edges to make sure that everything was even all the way around so it fit together better. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I, I think that. You know, that's probably what they did. But, you know, I like writing pretty long posts about the different books. And for me, it was kind of a, you know, I was just kind of get it so that I could I could research them and have them and do some comparisons. Um, well, you could always come visit me. <laughs> yeah, I could. But you're way over there in uh, Michigan City, man. I don't know when I'm going to get down there next. But so so it not only had Swamp Thing, it had um, a bunch of DC horror. Huh. Uh, it was pretty cool. I liked it, and I didn't pay a huge amount for it. So for me, it was worth it just to get them. You know, like I said, I was hoping that they that they would come with some spine left intact, but that wasn't the case, and I'm okay with it because you know. They present well in in bags and boards. Yeah, they look good. And they and when I wrote the post about it, you know, most of the of the Navarros from this period are pretty. You know, it's hard finding them in any kind of decent grade because these, you know, taking the fact that they were the spine and was destroyed and they were trimmed, even though they're basically an incomplete book right now, the the color strike and the print quality got saved because it was bound. So they look beautiful. I mean, they're just gorgeous, gorgeous books. And the interior pages are beautiful. So, you know, that's something that we see a lot in the foreign world. 
you know, they didn't have bags and boards. So very often, even though it was expensive, um, collectors in other countries would go to binding or toming, or there's different adjectives that they like to use to preserve these books for the future. Because without bags and boards, what were they going to do? Just keep them stacked? That, so uh, in that in that, that regard, cover an original or is that a a re a different one? No, this is from the DC run. I forget okay. what issue is it. Issue four, Tim. I forget. Uh, it's, it's number one and number six. Six, it's number six. six. Yeah, okay. but these were my my two favorite rights and covers from the run. But um, yeah, I was I was excited to get them. A little sad when when they when they I opened up the the book and Leaf they were up. completely leaf loose leafed. But um, I'm okay with it. I'm gonna say it to the to the audience. Last time, you know, if you're not watching this on video, you're you're losing out. So if you're on audio only, man, you should check out the uh, YouTube link on this guy. Yeah, there's we're gonna show some stuff today for sure. Um, I also got I I build the 122 set. It's it's one of my 120, favorite ASM 122. ASM 122. It's one of my favorite books from the run. Um, well, I'd, I'd say from the Bronze Age run, but um. This one I've been searching for in a while. This is the Brazilian E-Ball. And it's not bad. It's not in bad condition. Um, I know that it's real. With some of the Brazilian books, they have uh, Fossi Mills, what they call Fossi Mills, um, which are modern printings of them. And some of the tricks you can use to make sure, you know, you can check the staples if, they're, if they have a, uh, a certain amount of discoloration or rust, then you know it's that it's definitely a actual vintage book uh, because they use modern staples on those uh, uh, reprinted modern books. So that's one way you can tell. And so sometimes when buying e-balls, even though when you find some that are a little like this one's got some, some little staining dots up here and it's, it's not in the best condition. It's maybe a VG plus I'm okay with it. Cause I, I, I you know, it's a guarantee that it's definitely a vintage book. But this will add. I'll add this to my 122 set, and uh, very stoked about that. Very How many do you have in your set now? Um, I think it's like maybe. Uh, I can tell tell you real quick here. Side um, note: Hey Tim. Yeah. Question: I was talking to um, Sky out on Facebook, and he was saying that a couple of the Golden Age Brazilians didn't use staples at all. You said they used like a glue binding on some of the Golden Age books? Yes. Okay. So Staples was probably implemented later on, right? Yeah. And it, I mean, it, that might have been a factor that, you know, came in due to, you know, steel being harder to get at the time during the war. Um, it might have been something the publisher was doing to try to, to reduce costs. It might have been something they played around with. It, okay. I mean, it's hard to say, and unless you find somebody that actually worked for the publisher at the time, and you, you know, they have any knowledge on it, I don't think we're yeah. for sure. But yeah, I, I have seen some of the the stuff from Brazil from the forties. It's it's got it's glued rather than stapled. Yeah, because he showed me four books, and it's like one of the four caps that I show I shared in the hangouts with uh, with Matt and uh, John. <clears throat> one of them was straight glue, and the other three were the staples. So one of them is completely glue, like there's no staples anywhere in it. And I was wondering if that was something that's current or is it something that just danced around with the steel problem? Yeah, I, like I said, I, I think that it was probably something to do with, you know, conserving steel for the war effort. Okay. So how would you, the CBCS International Comic Specialist, figure out if that addition, you know, glue was a standard versus a staple or would you just... Is there a way to determine that, or is it just uh, seeing that book? Well, it, the the biggest indication is you know if it's something that staples were were removed from and it was glued back together, you're, you're going to have staple holes. Uh, right. But then, it, it it's also not unheard of either for books to leave the printers, even you know American books manufactured with no staples or only a single staple. That's true too. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a, a Silver Age with no staples the other day. It was uh amazingly complete. I have no idea how out of a an original <laughs> owner collection. A kid collection basically, so I don't know it, how that made it. It does happen. So. Hmm. That's crazy. 
you know, just just me being just starting in this in this pool, as Matt would say, you find the out that there's a lot. Pool. Yeah, I'm talking about 13. Say, he likes to say niche, but then John yells at him for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I could just say this end of the this end of the the collecting of comics is definitely that thing of you have to know the history, you have to do research to see if it's a fake or a replica. You know, Matt gave me some tips about like looking for staples on some of the e balls. Like I came across a guy that he wants to trade me GI Joes for some like the Batman two two seven e ball. You know that thing's like what how much a hundred bucks on eBay, but all he it's wants a is nice trade one some, too. Yeah, he wanted to trade like three GI Joes for like fifty bucks for one of those, and he's giving me the e, uh, the Brazilian X Men two sixty six, the um, X Men the first appearance with Bishop. He's giving me that one too, and it's all for a trade of fifty bucks. So I was like, that would be my first two two seven when we make that exchange. Yeah, it's and it's nice, Robert. It's. <laughs> You know, I've seen a lot of E-Ball 227s, and very often they don't come looking that nice. Remember, I was a little concerned, too, and that's why I told him, get pictures yeah. of the staples. But the staples looked good, so he's he, good. A couple of things you can use to indicate whether or not the Brazilian books are reprints or if they're originals. Um, more often than not, they'll have the, the originals will have some level of foxing. Uh, and it's just due to the environment in Brazil. Um, yeah. The other thing is, if you get a nice clear shot of the cover, a lot of times with the reprints, the uh, the print registry is off a little bit. I understand. And there's dot gain. The yeah. blacks, the blacks are thicker, a little bit thicker. You can only see it in the text, and I think that's because they took the original. See, I used to I used to work in the print shop world, so I know a little bit about it. But if you take if you keep making a reproduction of a reproduction of a reproduction, it, all the colors start, it, you get what's called dot gain. And so I think if you can take, uh, if you actually could see a real e-ball and a reproduction side by side, if you look at any of the text of the black text, it should mm -hmm. be thicker on the reproduction. It should look fat, like, like bolder. Okay. Um, and we've seen that. We've seen that with a couple of the issues where we've been able to compare scans and such. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up too, though, Tim, is sometimes with those Golden Age books, you got to be careful because uh, my understanding is there were Brazilian Golden Age collectors that removed the staples altogether, even on some of the stapled books, because of the rust migration was getting so bad. Oh, yeah. So that, 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 you'll see that too. Staples removed from, from any of the, uh, well, even even the e-balls, you'll see. Even the e-balls, even the, yeah, even the, the bronze e balls will get it. Yeah, but again, you're gonna, you're still gonna have the staple holes there, so that's how you'll know yeah. if it's originally staple or not. So just checking the YouTube chat, Scott McManus uh, threw out that uh, sometimes they will, when the staples rust out, they'll use string to kind of replace it to hold it together. We mentioned uh, Captain Marvel. Yes. Uh, GB. Yeah, I've, I've seen that too. String like yarn or <laughs> like thread. <laughs> I assume he means thread, but, you know. Whatever they can get, man. That sounds like a Paul's problem waiting to happen. <laughs> we'll use some invisible thread to hold it together. <laughs> Fishing line. Rubber cement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I go that route. <laughs> yeah. So you got anything else to show us tonight, pickup-wise, Matt? No, just, just that e-ball and, and those Navarros. I do have... It's in the mail, and I'd love to. I wish it had gotten here in time, but I do have that Satan Seven on its way to me. Oh, so yeah, when that when book. that gets here, definitely I'm going to share that. Well, I think um, you should show uh, nah. some pictures of your other one at some point today because that's yeah, uh, an amazing book. We can, but I'm I yeah that that's it. Just so. All right, Robert, do you want to show off uh, your pickup since you've been in the world of uh, the foreign yeah. craziness? Yes, I can do that. I'd say the last podcast was, what, 58? Since 58, you know, my first purchase, you know, I kind of talked it over with Matt, was uh, the Mundi Comics, La Pantera Negra. This is my first one on eBay. This is 20 bucks. So where's that one out of? Spain, I believe. Spain. Spain, yeah. all right. And Mundi, it's, a, re Mundi it's Comics. a redraw. It's a redraw yep. by uh, Lopez Espy. Right, and that's the first one. And then... 
the very next one, you know, thinking it was going to be hard to obtain, but uh, I, I like think I could name one. drop. I like I got that frog the... on the last one. Woo! Yeah, keep That's one of my keeping that. Uh, right there. Got the keeping, keeping the theme going. I thought it was virtually impossible. I felt like Brian McClay. You know, I'm not going to get my hands on one, but he found this within a week of me talking to Gab Gabrielle in Greece. I got this good, one good, in the mail good. pretty quick. He has the rest of the run too, but I'm I'm want to pull the trigger on it. But I know it's like eight covers, so this is the first one of many. That's a beautiful that, book. That's a pretty book. Yeah, yep. yeah. The Greek's and, just, uh, that, that writing is just amazing. It's, right? Yeah, there's some about the Greek editions that just give you a geek boner. I don't know what it is, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hashtag geek boner, Jesus. But <laughs> not even you know, sure but, to think about that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I can say that this is the one that this is the book that actually drew me in to wow, that actually would be cool next to the Jack Kirby American version. So this that's is the, the book that kind of cover, just different, yeah. uh, different, just read language basically. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the one that kind of hooked me in. But then, you know, you guys kind of threw this through the curveball and then showed me this bad boy. Yeah. So this wasn't the first one I obtained. The first one, this is probably the fifth one I've obtained, but I'm currently one issue away from finishing the set. Yeah, what so, is the set again? Because you got to account for the uh, the listeners. Okay, so uh, this, what is uh, Weekly Playboy number 32? This is the one with Amazing Fantasy 15 reprint in it. And uh, the constant conversations I've had with Andy is definitely a thing of it's not the first Spidey in Japan. But this is the first one they printed in uh, something this obscure. So the well, conversation is non manga, right? Yes. Yeah, and he I said think that, so. Yeah. Yeah, he said those uh the ones with uh Leopoldo, the the machine, the big robot one, those are the mangas. He's talking me into buying those too because those I are I saw kinda... those the other day and I was like, Man, I might need those. Yeah, yeah those he... are cool. The manga shit's cool, man. But you know, this is thirty two. And then the constant conversations of uh I don't know if Tim could talk could talk a little bit more about it, but um, on the CBCS forum, they only have like this one and two others that's on there, but they don't have the other ones in the run. So the conversations between John and Matt saying, I see 32 and I see 36. And, you know, me me doing the math, I'm thinking, there's some other, they're not just going to do random issues. It has to be a run. So yeah. me me doing further research, I found out it's 32 through 41. Uh -huh. So... Filling in the voice. Number 40 is the last one I need. I missed it by 30 seconds, which I'm kind of mad oh, about. Oh, man. I missed that on Rinkia, and it was like 30 seconds. I got to 36, but I missed the 40, and I was like, oh. So now it's the last one that evades me, but this is 32. So and they each one of them. Issues AF well, it's not AF15. It's Spectacular Spider-Man 1, which is AF15. Yes. And then right. it's SM1 to 9? Yes. And then, you know, as I go through the list, these are like these are the ones I don't see on the forum. This one, and they're and pretty is... not racy covers, honestly. No, some of them are yeah. fully clothed. It almost makes you question whether or not it's Playboy or not. But you know, for yeah. most of them, are uh... like Sports Illustrated or something. <laughs> yeah, it looks more like the to... swimsuit issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And then like this one, she has on a full fledged shirt. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> that, that could be a lifestyle magazine. You wouldn't know. Indication of the, the cultural difference, though. Yeah, uh, it does. Yeah. But in this one, she has on a shirt where she looked like she's naked, but it's a T-shirt. Oh, so yeah. like, <laughs> wait, what? So, yeah, right, look, she, if you look at it, a, you can see this. You can see the the ring around the neck and the yeah, bottom of it. Oh, shirt. I see. She she has a screen like a on in the middle. Yeah, it's like a fake nude. Yeah, that's interesting. So, someone tried to flag that on our Facebook page, and we're like, uh, it's not real. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> they were trying to flag comic related, and yeah, yeah. And then this is the last one of the run. Nice. Huh. Those are so demure, like so tame. Hey, do you want to tell them what you uh, remember? Matt showed the uh, the centerfold across from Spider Man. You were playing with Google Translate, and which page did it actually have there? <laughs> the bottom right hand corner. It actually has with great power comes great responsibility, <laughs> right on the page, huh. right across from the new duty page. So every <laughs> last one of these, the every last one of these oh. has a centerfold right next to the end of the comic. So. I thought that was kind of funny too. Do you do you want me to share that picture real quick so that they can see it? People can see it. 
Yes, I wish I would have scanned these so you would have those two to kind of show for everybody. Do you mind if I share real quick, John? And yeah, I'll just you... just in case we got users that are watching that don't that don't know. That's fine. I think we showed it last time. Let's see, I'm, I was just thinking of showing that that page. Oh wait, no, it's right here. And the page that we're talking about is right here. Oh, you did it. You scanned it out because you're a good human. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the great power comes great responsibility. I think that's where the is bottom, that? Right here. Two, right there. Those two word bubbles to the left, right in the center. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, right there. there. And it's just such a interesting thing to have right next to a shot of a chick <laughs> showing her yeah. breasts. Yeah, responsibility to look at the next page. That's pretty much what you're saying. With great responsibility comes great power. <laughs> you owe yourself this responsibility to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's just so weird. It's just so weird. Okay. I'll, but I'll, each I'll, one, I'll, but each one of the stories have a showcase villain. So it's like one of them is a Sandman. The other one is like the Vulture. It's like each one of the each one of the issues have a villain theme in each one. So I thought uh. I want to get the complete set to figure out, like, you know, give a complete list of which one is which for those fans out there looking for certain villains. Well, you, you have done your, your, your work in gathering all that in such a short amount of time. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's impressive. And uh, I was wrong. I've forgotten. Yeah. Henry probably would be the first American that has, ta that probably has that whole run. Um, and he's, he's like, the most knowledgeable guy on Japanese books that we know of. Um, but you would be right in there on second, Robert. I thought considering that would take you much longer. In. Yeah, I kind of did too, but you've been hitting Rinka like crazy. And Andy really helped. He helped fill in a lot of those holes too, I think. Yeah, he found him pretty quick. And he said this never happened for him when I talked to him on Facebook Messenger. And that's probably the main focal point of anything foreign. Get your hands on it. Definitely got to communicate. Definitely yeah. have to talk. You got to kind of throw yourself out there to see, you know, who's willing to talk back or whether whether they help you or not. So, you know, even on Global Comics, that's another one, too, where you kind of yeah. get that outside resource to getting your hands on some of those other books that's outside of, you know, those countries that are, as you would call it, like, you know, not really mobile friendly. So it's definitely, yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely open communication. You got to really... Get yourself out there, show, you know, what you're looking for. Like the She-Hulk, I have that uh, Yaffa She-Hulk, the one that's kind of the hardest ones. And, oh, um, yeah. And Spiro said that those were mass produced. So he was saying it's just it's just a factor of getting a better condition one versus it being rare. It's rare to get a good copy than getting a beat copy. He said a beat copy you can find anywhere. Like even that uh, Batman 227, he said, oh, those yeah. were mass, he said those were mass produced too. But he was saying that it's just getting the grade that you want is going to be the issue. So he was like, you also gotta remember in certain countries, mass produced means different than it means here, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, not in the millions you know, or anything like that. So well, I was in that I was in that thread when he was saying that. No, I, I wasn't gonna I wasn't in uh I think you're it was uh Daniel Best that was saying that, I thought. But anyway, um I he says that, but I gotta tell you that that tip top, that two two seven tip top is was. I mean, it was hard yeah. to find. He said I knew that guys was hard. looking for it. He, I mean, in any grade, it was hard to find. So I, yeah. I do think that there were some Australian books that, um, I mean, if they're that whole era of of KG Murray stuff seems to be tough, and I, I don't, I, I think part of it is just neglect. Um, there was a shop I contacted over there several years ago. They said they've got like long boxes of that stuff sitting in their back room that's just sitting there um, because nobody, nobody there wanted it. And you know, I told them, look, I'll, I'll pay minimum 20, 25 bucks a book for stuff that's on my point list. They're like, no, we're not going to bother going through it. I mean, they, they cared that little at that point in time. Yeah, it's crazy. I've heard that story too. Tim, you killed it. <laughs> At twenty-five dollars a book, you think it'd be worth their time to at least go through it a little bit? Oh yeah, because it's not like I had a short list of stuff I was looking for. 
But yeah, but I could say for this, for this part of the hobby, it's definitely, it's opened my eyes to other things out there. Like right now I'm in the process of getting my hands on one of the older golden age caps. You know, Those Sky actually, yeah, Sky actually let my get, let me get a piece of those books that he's been hoarding. <laughs> in, uh, yeah, he in does have an impressive uh, collection of everything foreign. He's yeah, probably got the lo- one of the largest collections of foreign editions. No, he's trying to open. The, he's trying to open a museum. <laughs> For those uh, listening, uh, if you're on Facebook, Sky Ott is is who it is. If, and if you follow, you'll follow any of the groups. You'll see some posts. But he he has yeah just been buying impressive a long time. Yeah, he's like got he has crazy three stuff. copies. He has three copies of the first appearance of Cat in uh, Brazil. Ojiri seventy three. I think I'm saying it right. Is it Ohiri or Ojiri? I don't know if it's Oguri or Ojiri. Okay. Or- yeah, my, yeah. my Portuguese is is not good. So yeah, I don't know what the G, how the G would be pronounced. Would it be like gra, like o gra, go I I don't know. <laughs> well, the cool thing about that is he found one that has my birthday in 1943, and I was like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that's I super want cool. It. I want cool, it. Cool cover. <laughs> yeah, it's a cap. It's a cap close up, like he's punching somebody, and it has like the 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 the, the action color around the edges, like orange and red. And it looks clean too. He said he gives it like maybe a 5.0. But I think uh, I'm worried about the size. I don't know if CBCS could. Uh, I think I guess my question to Tim is: like, Would it fit inside a CBCS case? Is it worth grading? Or it will not fit in our current cases now. Uh, those are larger than a standard Golden Age book from the states. Dang. <laughs> we will be getting larger slabs eventually, but it's it's down the line. Time yet. I'm going to just interject an observation just because I saw something unique uh, this week. Um, I'm going to talk about the competitor for just a minute. Uh, I saw that there had been previously a, a size of books that CGC wouldn't do. They were the some of the oversized magazines. A couple examples would be like Warrior 1 out of the UK. Uh, the, the one that I just saw that I hadn't seen slabbed in a long time was the... Um, uh, deadline one the first tank girl and it appears that they have converted from the old slabs to the new slabs and it must fit these magazines a little better because i'd seen a new a new design magazine slab of those coming out so those books that were rare in a slab may be less so here in a few months so just huh if you're out there hunting be aware i'll be right okay. back guys i'm gonna get my, a power source for my laptop i'm about to die right. hold on so yeah just one of those weird things you see hunting obscure books even if they're not foreign so uh, yeah so i guess so i guess the standard golden age books were kind of like uh i couldn't even give the dimensions of it but when you get to those brazilians they're what a notch higher like one of those um is it, uh vampirella sizes or is it bigger they're they, they vary um okay again it's it, a, lot, a lot like the navarro stuff you know there there's a few different size formats on those it, it wasn't necessarily standards that, that they went by it. I, and I know that like for uh, 2000 AD out of the UK, mm-hmm. you know, they, they had the printer run off the current issue, the same size as whatever the last thing they were printing was. So they didn't have to reset and recalibrate everything on the presses because it was more cost effective that way. Um, I don't know if that was the same practice that was used in Brazil, but I know that that's tough. There is no standard size necessarily. Okay. Uh, that's got to make your job impossible. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. So since since we're kind of leading into it, so how how what is your role as the uh, international comic specialist? How how does it how does that fit into the grading process? Um, pretty much, I would say eighty percent or better of the international books that get submitted, I do the labels on. Um. Sometimes it involves research. If it's something I haven't seen, which happens more often than you would think. Um, oh, wow. Well, I mean, I, that, that's why I don't like when people call me an expert, because experts know everything about their field, and I, I don't. Uh, you know more than most, though. Well, yeah, but I've been at it for a decade. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, uh, the one guy down at the office, Jim Noble, uh, he... he He's really good with a lot of the, the modern 
variants. Before I left the office and stopped grading, I, I trained him on how to do like a lot of the new panini and and that kind of stuff, the Marble Mexico stuff, so mm -hmm. that you know they it wouldn't it wouldn't slow down the process because we do see you know more of that stuff come in than anything. I mean, you don't see very many people send in a stack of you know twenty or thirty Laprenza books. It just it it doesn't happen very often. So I should do that. Well, I mean, if you want, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, and, and Jim does a great job of it. I mean, he's, you know, he, he's, he's got a mind that is able to hold on to that information. So, you know, if it's something that has already been done in the system, he's, he's able to pull up a match on it. And I mean, the, the kid's sharp. He really is. I mean, sometimes just finding a match has to be hard. I mean, I, I, just my own personal example is trying to hunt the census um, for the Italian 300 uh, ASM. I, there's four listings in CGC. So somebody's typed it one way and somebody typed another and somebody yeah. typed a third and they've spread out. So I got to imagine if you're doing, you know, every country out there, there's some crazy stuff happening. Right. And and that's one of the things that, that held CBCS back as far as getting a census up and running is, you know, s simple things like, you know, typos, you know, if you have, Amazing Spider-Man, you know, you've got several different volumes, but then if you have it entered in the system with two spaces after Amazing before Spider-Man, you know, it's, it's going to show different as, in, as the data is collating. So, you know, we're having to go through and, and sort all that out. That, that's something that we've been working on, but it's, it's very time intensive. And, you know, we're still a small company. I mean, we don't, there's only, what, I think like 30 of us maybe. And it's wow. only been what was it four years now? Uh, five. five. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you how do you get your information? Though? Like uh, you're not on site, so how are you how are you participating in it? Uh, as far as when there's a label that needs to be done, they'll send me an image of the front cover of the book, um, the usually the interior front cover or first page wherever the indicia is at, and then. If there's more than one story in the book, they'll send me an image of the first story page of each story in there. Uh, there's what a lot of stuff. What do you use that for? Uh, just so that I can accurately notate what's contained in a book. Okay. Uh, a good example is like the, the Greek Spider-Man 238. Uh, it's got the 238 cover, slightly altered color-wise. And Amazing Spider-Man 238 is the feature story in the book, but then there's a second story in that book, which is Iron Man 55. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah. That, that stuff, you know, all, it all gets notated on the back of the label as far as what's printed in the book. And I also go through and kind of stitch together all the art and story credits for both books, as well as all the key comments stating first appearances and, you know, whatever else might be relevant. Yeah. Okay. So you you were the research guru. Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of. I guess he's the guy. He's the guy that knows where. If he doesn't know the info, he knows either the expert of that specific country to to call on, or he knows the database where to find the information, or some obscure site. And you know, it, it's what's interesting about that is Tim's been doing that kind of organically even before he started working at cbcs everyone in the niche in the early days was kind of their own researcher because we didn't know uh, a whole lot about individual editions so to learn and figure out what's out there and whatnot we just slowly started keeping tabs on all these sites that could help us out and it's a huge amount of information to try to keep in your brain so I mean, so Tim's knowledge on where to find that information to make that accurate notation, it's, it's priceless. No one else is going to know that. Yeah. Well, there, a few there's people. Some, there's some good resources out there, too. Um, like for a while, Stefan, when he would send in, you know, heritage books, uh, he would send me a list of you know, all the information he had on those books. Uh, last time I was up in Montreal, I picked up a, a copy of the EH Guide. And oh my God, it's it's in French, uh, which I'm actually getting, I guess, kind of good at reading. But 
um, it, so, it, you know, I, I don't necessarily have to use Google Translate to, to figure out what it is I need information wise out of there. But I mean, they've got so much stuff in there that's, that's indexed. So, you know, I just open it up to whatever page I need and just go from there. Do you have a copy of that book that we could see the cover to right uh, at, right at hand? I do. Um, it's a really cool book. They didn't produce a whole lot. I have, and, I have the um, second edition, the hardcover one. I don't have the soft cover. And this was like what? It was like four guys, right, Tim? Four experts? Yes. That took him about eight years to pull all that info together. Um, while he's looking for that, Blue Green Artifacts was wondering about modern variants, like the um, Edge of Spider-Verse 2 land variant. His question was, um, do foreign countries like Mexico print the uh ratio variants like do they print theirs in the same numbers that the u.s do, does not not generally um oftentimes they will take whatever cover they like the best or sometimes they cover off another book entirely um they used the land variant on that book i think because they liked it better uh, i don't think the the original like you know standard cover from the states i don't think that exists in mexico this yeah. Is the EH guy? I don't know if you guys can see that. Huh? Cat but, front and center. It's, I mean, Hold on, a, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you to present for this. Yeah, it, it's a fairly thick book too. So, oh, there you show it one more time. Okay, nice cap cover. Oh yeah. But, so this was mass produced, or this was a? No, these there was a very small print run on these, and like I said, it's it gives you a breakdown. Issue by oh, wow. issue, indexed of what's in there. I mean, even when they have like a little one-page poster, um, and it, it does. It's not complete. They don't have you know that kind of information available for like all the Archies and some of the the, the more obscure titles. There was a few original titles that EH did too that they don't have in here. Uh, this guide, though, uh, I just talked to a guy, his name's Mark, he owns a store up in Montreal called Comic Hunter, which I go to every time I'm up there. Great place. Uh, he said the, the copies of the guide are starting to sell for about 500 a piece. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're I'm, because of the, the original soft cover print run, I think Jean Francois said there was maybe a thousand copies. Um, and the hardcover, I think they only did. 500 of so yeah. there's not a lot of them floating around yeah notice you need the keypad behind you to get to that thing you know, <laughs> locked up well, yeah, that's... oh tim's like fort knox man <laughs> yeah that all was, i heard was that's beep, 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 beep. Where I keep some of my odds and ends that can't be replaced <laughs> mm. solid idea so what uh you know just since you're you're kind of at the you see it i guess i mean at least you get requests what what are you kind of seeing as the the trends what are people sending in for grading what's what's kind of the more popular things that you keep seeing across is it certain sets is it certain books or editions of books is it certain publishers are, are starting to pick up steam what 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 are you seeing out there outside of the moderns that obviously are probably getting it's a popular. it's a really random mix there's i mean there's times where somebody will send in you know it, an invoice with 20 books on it and two of them are just completely random, you know, Zinco books from Spain. Uh, there's times where, you know, I'll see an order come in. That's, you know, they have some Novedadas in there uh, along with a couple of German books. Uh, most of the time it's, it's, it's keys, not necessarily, you know, yeah. the big keys, but a lot of the, the more minor keys. Um, some of the characters are, that are starting to get popular now, um, uh, like the first appearance of Vixen. Um, trying to think well. Sure Taskmaster's seen. getting in his day. Yeah. Um, not, now you said not too long ago, there was a guy sent in, and th this one was interesting. It was uh, the animated Turtles book, the first one they did, based on the cartoons. Oh, yeah. Um, Paul, it, Paul's paying attention now. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. You got Paul the it, it, It's a copy of that book from Mexico, but. The interesting thing about it is the the cover and all the interior art was completely redrawn by a Mexican artist. Huh. Interesting. So are yeah. there are there reprints of uh, the original Mutant Turtles magazine anywhere? 
any of the countries do that? Uh, I'm honestly, I'm not sure. You haven't, I haven't seen, seen them. I, have not I seen haven't seen them, it. But that's not to say they're not out there. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to send, well, other than the, the cheap Russian reprint reprints Paul's collected. Yeah, I love those things. I have the, seen some animal legs. books. Um, uh, Ustagi got done in Sweden in a few places, I think. Yeah. But I don't know about, I haven't, I can't really say I've seen a, a Turtles foreign edition that used the classic number one artwork. I, I would think that there might be somewhere. I would like I, to think maybe Japan did it. There was there was a regular comic size one. I think they did as a uh, convention special for La Mole. A couple oh. of years ago. They, had, they had Kevin Eastman down as a guest of honor. That's pretty cool. Oh. A La Mole that, variant. That might be yeah, uh, the trend now with the... Uh, that, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Paul. No, I was going to say that might be attainable then. That's it should said. be. Yeah, yeah, it should be. So I would uh, you'd find some, a, a couple copies on Mercado Libre or uh, possibly even Toto Coliseum. Yeah. It's hard to navigate so, the Mercado Libre. You know. Oh, yes, yeah. It is. <laughs> usually it's with very, Mercado, uh, it's, uh, it's better. With all the Mercado sites, it's usually better to have a third party pick stuff up off of the sites for you and interestingly enough now you have you have some savvy mexicans realizing that they can make money just picking up stuff for americans on mercado and i think it might be as a result of not just comics but other stuff other collectible hobbies and yeah, gi um, joe's is big yeah so you'll find you'll find within ebay itself i believe guys advertising their services for picking up stuff off of mercado and um so, you know, that's usually easier than trying to get an account yourself. Though it can be done, it's usually easier to just have someone else do it. Because they don't want to ship out of country a lot of times. A lot of them don't want to ship or they don't use PayPal or they they use other different weird stuff. And so, well, but not only that, uh, like um, I've had people get stuff off of Mikado though for me that I trusted that knew it that their gut on whether a listing was bad or good, like whether it sound, seemed like a ripoff or not, you know, for us as, a, as, or for me as an American to go into Mercado or even, you know, uh, the Brazilian Mercado or the Colombian Mercado, um, you know, I that? wouldn't, my gut, well, Mercado, Mercado Libre is like a company that's like a satellite company that handles all, it's a big auction site in spanish speaking the spanish speaking latin world um and my understanding of it is that you know how ebay and paypal were in bed together yeah well mercado libre was in bed with something called uh what was it called tim paisa pay or something like that yeah. it was a different kind of credit processing uh -huh. so the last thing mercado wanted was americans coming on and getting uh, getting people interested in PayPal and the ease of use of PayPal because they want that other company that's handling the uh, the transactions in the Spanish-speaking Latin world. They don't want PayPal muscling into their shit. So what we what we saw a lot was um, hold on, just closing this door. Was the different Mercado sites made it kind of hard to to create an account. And you'll see that also in some of the other foreign countries. Um, like they, well, for one, you got to deal with the language barrier. So if you can't read Spanish, you're kind of screwed. But right. you can do that through Google Translation, either through in browser, in browser window, or just having a second window open. But it sometimes, like with Rinkia. <laughs> yeah, like with Rinkia. But sometimes they, they'll make it to where you need a local phone number or you oh. need a local address. All these little mm -hmm. hoops that they try to get people to jump through so that they can try to ensure that you're from that region or location. Um, so as foreign hunters, a lot of the guys came up with tricks. So one of the tricks was if you were trying to get a Mercado account or let's say a, a QXL account or one of the other foreign uh, auction sites, you would use the address and phone number of the Hilton hotel in that country. Because mm -hmm. most Hilton hotels, you can pretty easily on the web find uh, their address and phone number. So that so there's there's ways you can jump through the hoops to, to get the get an account there, but it's probably best in as far as Mercado is concerned 
to use a third party that that's there in country. But then again, you run across the issue of not if you don't have access to that. We used to joke all the time because um, for the longest time, we didn't have a contact in Brazil in the early days. So we'd go to the Brazilian Mercado and see all these amazing e-balls and books. And it was like being a kid in a candy store, but you couldn't. <laughs> You couldn't, uh, you couldn't buy anything. You didn't have any money. There was, or even if you had the money, there was not. Maybe uh, you're in a candy store without someone working the front desk. I don't know. But um, so it can be difficult. But uh, there's ways around it. Tim, I googled. Uh, I googled just Lamol Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle on or eBay it rather, and I'm not sure if they made what you were talking about. I see a number 68 Comic Con variant for Eastman, and then um, and then the, the art book. So I. Did I misunderstand? Did you say they made a, a full size reprint, or did I misunderstand? No, if, if they did one, I'm, I'm sure it was just a, a standard comic size. Okay, I can go. I can go on Mercado and look hmm. as well. So let me look I had a, I, there was a YouTube question I want to jump back to. Um, Blue Green Artifacts had asked about like the the Mexican reprints, the end of the land, and such. Um, how are they labeled when they come out years later? You know, are they labeled the first appearance? They labeled reprint of or a foreign variant of? How, well, what's that's the, a good question. Standard? That's uh, a very good question. Okay, so the the approach I take with that is the first time a story is translated into a given language, it gets all the same art and story credits and key comments as the original U.S. edition. Does and it doesn't matter if it came out five weeks later or five years later because it's it's still the first edition within that country mm -hmm. if it's printed again in that country you will find the art story credits listed as reprinted art and story on the back of the label uh it won't have the key comments on it and it will it will read reprints you know say avengers 167 in whatever the language is uh, but anything the, the first time it's translated into a language is is listed you know properly as an addition which it should be okay shit and we fought we fought at the cgc forums we argued with a lot of people about that for the longest time and i think we brushed on that on the, the last uh podcast we did but you know, the the truth is, these books are not reprints. They're just not. They're their own separate entities. They are, you know, they are editions. Well, I I look at it from the, the point of view that you know the the literary world does. You know, yeah. If if you have you know a cop if you have a copy of Great Expectations from the U.S. that's the first edition. You know, that's it is what it is when you translate that into German, it's not a German reprint. It's the first German edition of said yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. This, I grabbed, um, this is no different. I grabbed that Russian turtles. And I showed it. <laughs> I showed it last time. That's a cool it's, book. Anything it, Russian is awesome. man. Yeah. It, so it's smaller than a regular comic, but looking at it, I took out of the bag. So it's Nickelodeon. <laughs> um, and looking in the, on the inside, um, it was a uh, so on the back. It's something called Illusion Studios, but it's a uh, 2014 Nickelodeon Viacom kind of um, collaboration. But it, they just reprinted the original, so they um, it didn't have the um, you know redrawn by some Russian guy, some Russian artist or anything. But um, but yeah, it's pretty cool. I picked those up a while ago, and looks like it has kind of some history in here as well about. Um, Let's see where that go, like Peter, and here we go. Some pictures of that in the history of all those guys, uh, Peter and Kevin. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I have a couple copies. You know, they're not – none of them are nine eights, but I think I – one of these days I did want to try and find the best-looking one and send it in. Yeah, you should. And Tim Tim's done – he's done notations for Russian books before, I know, because um, my Russian uh, Hellboy – got slabbed by cbcs and it looks great i love it yeah it's not um you know and it's not i don't know how much research you'd have to do on it it's it's you know officially nickelodeon license so i don't know 
So I've been noticing, I don't know if it's been there before, but I've been noticing a lot more questions on, uh, on, on the, the Facebook group, the, the comic speculation and investing uh, Facebook group, as well as probably some of the other groups out there of, I've got this foreign first appearance or this foreign edition. Should I grade it? Um, you know, I, what, what are you seeing as far as that, uh, Tim, are you seeing, you know, high grade, low grade, any grade coming through? Is there, it, you know, is there any kind of standard that you're seeing happen? It, it varies from one country to the next. Um, you know, and, and Matt can tell you as well as anyone, high grade stuff from the Philippines is almost non-existent. Yeah. Um, it's impossible. The average you, you normally see from Mexico. And I, I mean, hell, John, you know, this, you know, the, 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 the nicest stuff you usually see from there is maybe six, six, five at best. Yeah. It's in the fine range. Um, so, but then, I mean, you'll, you'll find stuff from, you know, Australia that, that's high grade occasionally. Um, Germany. So, yeah. Germany, Italy, Spain, UK, but I mean, it, it just, it all depends on, you know, the quality of the, the materials they were using when it was printed and, you know, really what the collector mentality is. Yeah, the That's culture. That was huge. So my next question would be if uh, you said the Philippines is rare, what about the super comics in South Africa? Are those, do those come across you? That's a many, little many bit times? of a different animal. With the super comics, they're they're hard to get a hold of because the, the collectors there actually love those damn things and they don't want to let go of them. Um, there was, there was one, I, I don't know if it's the number one in their Superman run. Tony was looking for it. It's, uh, it's got the cover of Superman 419. Oh, don't ta taunt me. And <laughs> he found a guy that had one. He offered him a thousand dollars for it. This is <laughs> Jesus. At least five this, years ago. This was years ago. And, the guy turned him down flat. He's like, nope, not selling it. So that's the he, number one that has that on it? I, I believe so. I think he said, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> he told Tony something like that. Yeah. So it's, wow, I mean, it's amazing. It, as far as condition, though, I mean, it's, it's all over the board, just like it is with the U.S. stuff. You know, I mean, most copies of EC books that, that get sent in for grading are <laughs> low to mid-grade at best. But... You know, we also oh did have one guy send in like 120 of the Gaines file copies Whoa. that, you know, they literally look like they just came off the press because they pretty much sat in that state in, in Gaines' office for, you know, however long. I mean, those things, they're absolutely breathtaking. So what's the most uh, amazing foreign you've seen come through? What's, what's the one that's just made you go, holy cow? Um... We have had two copies come through of the uh, Pence copy of Hulk number one. Ooh, which, that's pretty cool. I mean, Hulk number one, that, that book's gone insane. Uh, but from everything I've been able to determine talking to people and, and digging a little bit of my own, uh, the Pence copy of Hulk number one is the scarcest Silver Age Marvel key because it was only about 5% of the entire print run that they printed for the UK. The average wasn't that popular. Was, went anywhere between 10 to 20%. Uh, wow. But without, without really knowing how well the book was going to take off uh, for whatever reason, they scaled back um, in the 35 years that I've been in comics and the, the five years I've been with CBCS um, I've seen three copies of that book. Hmm. Wow. I would take one of those over an AF-15 any day of the week. That's, the, not, that's not the kind of book I expected you to pull as a Pence. Honestly, I was thinking you were going to go somewhere obscure. What does uh, the cover look like? It's It looks Thank exactly you. like Hulk number one, only it's got, uh, I believe it's the Pence a, price? a 90. Yeah. It's either a 90 or a 60 price on it. Hmm. Wow. But yeah, that that book is ridiculously scarce. Um, I mean, I've I've seen some other stuff come through. I mean, some of those early South African. The didn't you do a Batman one? Yeah, a guy sent in. Um, it was 
detective number one and action number one from South Africa. Um, actually, that he, he's, those got sent in before I actually worked for the company. I was actually down there, I guess, interviewing. And <laughs> there was a few of the guys in the grading room standing around looking at him like, what the hell are these? And I looked at him and I'm like, oh, they're South African. And they're like, how do you know that? And I said, well, if you open the front cover and look at the NDC, it's going to say Johannesburg. Yeah. So that that was the first day I walked into the office. Like you're hired. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. That didn't close the deal, but it didn't hurt. Right. Huh. Um, Matt, you find anything on the turtles? Um, yes. I don't. It's uh, not issue one. It is. Uh, it's an art book. It's a La Mole art book. Yeah, I think I have one of those. Um. If you switch over to my screen. Z stepped away, so I don't know if we can. You might have. If you go to the left and hit share screen anyway, if we all. Oh, okay. Let's see. Hold on. Um... But it's, yeah, it's from. Um... It's, it's like. Um... Here, hold on. Okay, I'm sharing now. So, yeah, it's this art book. Was that uh -huh. the one you were thinking, Tim? Uh, that might be, yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think uh -huh. I had one of those. If, uh, and it looks pretty cool. But that, at least as far as Mercado, that's all I could find at the moment. It looks like um, it looks like there's a couple different mole. Um, on eBay, um, what popped up here? Batman, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Um, oh, that's a La Mole. I'm sorry. I thought it was French. Oh, so, wow. Are those just asking prices or what? Yeah, but it's in pesos, so you have to... Oh, I was going to say, because just... <laughs> yeah, here's the Deadpool one. Um... Yeah, the, the exchange rate on pesos generally hovers around... That's kind of a cool book. Five dollars. Huh. Um, it looks like they did a, a a cool FF art book too. There's yeah, a, the Mole is cool. That's a Superman art book too. Do you have that one, Tim? Yes, I do. You have to search in Spanish. Then is, I mean, you can't type in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and it would... well, <laughs> you, you well, like for me to find this, I just put in Mole and comic. Oh, okay. Because they, they, in the categories, you'll see they do have comics. Um, now, are, are, would, would the same websites be around if you were looking for actual trade or like like books, books, as in like novels? Is that? Um, You probably could. Yeah, you could find books. Like I if mean, you're looking for the Great Expectations Germany version or what? Yeah. Well, think of, think of Mercado Libre as their eBay, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, if you just look at categories, if you look at categories, libros right here, you got comics, and then you have your actual libros and revistas. So, literature, that's where you'd find, you know, different editions in Spanish or, you know, American books as well. Um, so, yeah, the, the Mercado system is just, in fact, at one point I thought they were, like, maybe that Mercado might even be a subsidiary of eBay. But or somehow there was a financial stake or whatever. I but think I, I don't owns, know. I think eBay owns part of it now. I think they bought into Mercado. Did they? Yeah, I figured yeah, there was some kind of something going on there. I think eBay had tried launching in in Central and South America the same way they did in Europe, and it didn't take because Mercado was already in place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, one thing I can say is that with uh, <coughs> with Rinkia and my process of finding the Playboys, even without talking to you first, Matt, I was playing around with it because you kind of threw out Rinkia before I went into the conversation of finding it, finding Andy and everybody to help me acquire the books. It was one of those things where you had to play around with the search engine because if you just type in Weekly Playboy, it gives you nothing. You have to turn around. 
and type in Playboy. I played with 1976. I played around with, you know, Shua Shia and printings. And, you know, I finally came across one where I just typed in Playboy and it gave me all the lists. And I was like, wait, I got to look through 2000? <laughs> yeah. That, that's where Total Coliseum is probably one of the better designed sites because you can actually switch over to search in English. Well, even if you're uh, searching on eBay, you've got to know what, you know, if you're going into to the foreign eBays, you've got to know what category they put things in because, you know, we, we put comics in its own thing as, as a collectible, but uh, I've been in some countries where it's under <clears throat> books or, you know... I, all kinds of other categories. So if you limit yourself in a category before you even search to the foreign market, you've already lost all those search results you might have found. Right. Yeah, you got to do some soul searching when you get into those search <laughs> engines because you got to actually word it right, make sure it's spaced. If you spell it wrong, you're in deep water. So, Robert, um, how, uh, um, can you talk to a little bit about that since you're new to this of people who are listening and want to kind of follow in your footsteps? How did that work for you to get in with the guys like they just open arms or hey i'm looking for this and <clears throat> well i can say is you know like after the podcast you know i reached out to foreign comic collective you know the facebook group and a couple of people uh you know first you know it was matt that kind of put me in and then he kind of pointed me in the direction of certain people looking for certain books it's like if you just go in and type in like hey i'm looking for this so that means screenshots help you a lot to uh, find out like who who knows about it, who doesn't. And it can point you in the direction saying like, you know, like Matt will put a name of a person to help me search for it. Then after that, it goes from there to starting the conversation, figuring out about the book. You get a little bit of history about it when they tell you about it. And then from there, they say, all right, I found this one. Do you like this or do you want this one? Or, you know, thus far in the past month, I've been shown, what maybe 30 books that i'll probably never see again or just outside of my price range so i mean you know it's it could be expensive as all get out but some of it is rewarding when you get to come across a book you'd be like wow i didn't even know that cover existed i want that like somebody showed me the second appearance of dr doom fantastico quattro with the uh oh, the you know, it's the, yeah it's a yellow dr doom mm -hmm. and i was like wow i want that but i'm afraid to ask how much it costs <laughs> So some of them are expensive, but thus far, like the Black Panther cost me like 25. Shipping's probably, shipping's probably the one thing you probably have to worry about the yeah. most in this niche. Yeah. Shipping, definitely. Probably most about this collecting, so you definitely want to make sure you cover yourself with that. Like, you know, John can tell you too, Rinkia, you know, the shipping alone is like, what? The book's only 15 bucks, but why am I spending $35 on shipping? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, my first, uh, the Spider-Man, I bought one before you got on the hunt, and I bought one there. Matt sent me a link. I spent, I think, $27 on the book. I paid $15 to rent you. I spent something on something else. I then sent the shipping. It was almost $100 all in for a $27 book. Wow. But then next thing you know, you come across Andy, and he's like, give me a nice price. Like, okay, that works. <laughs> I very early on adopted the mentality of, you know, whatever the shipping is on top of whatever book or books I'm getting, it, it's just it's part of the price of the book you know yeah if, if, if you think of it yeah. as, as shipping and and have that that feeling that you know you're not really getting any value out of that it it makes it more difficult to pull the trigger on buying but the rarity of it is what <laughs> makes it kind of rewarding to me it's that one thing to say you know you like even when i showed a picture of it they'll say like wait is that for real I'm like yes I'm like where do you get that <laughs> it called it's called uh research and work yeah <laughs> it's not it's not going to fall in your lap at all well, and, and, to... <laughs> and robert i mean that's that's the fun thing like you were telling you were showing weren't you saying you were showing uh some of those <clears throat> japanese playboys to some collectors and that their minds were blown like being able to being able to take some of these foreigns that are that are 
not so well known to like cons and stuff and show people. Uh, Tim and I, our favorite thing to do in the early days was to go to old time dealers like Harley E and stuff and say, hey, I bet you I have something here you've never seen. And you get to hear Harley say, I've seen it all, kid, or whatever. And uh, then you show them uh, EKS, former Yugo Spider-Man 129, and they go, oh, well, maybe I I have not seen that, you know? It, yeah, so like it, I was in, um, it's neat. Yeah, yeah well, I, I was uh, a I, very Tim. <laughs> I have the opportunity to get a lot of books signed doing as many conventions as I do. And... It, it's it's funny because I'll you know I'll be standing in line with somebody you know witnessing signatures for them, or just you know in line on my own, and they'll see what I've I've got in my hands, and they're like, "What the hell is that?" Huh. Um, and a lot of the creators too they haven't seen a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, Mike Zeck and John Beatty love when I bring them books to sign because they know it's it's not just going to be you know another copy of you know Secret Wars number eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've taken them some books and they're like, this is just fantastic. Pretty sure it's mind blowing, but you know, it's uh, like I was saying, uh, my local, my LCS is uh, Third Eye Comics with Brian Wood. And I walked in there with the number 32 Playboy and I pulled it out. And it was, I say, probably about five or six people from across the room was like, wait, what? <laughs> Playboy and Spider Man? What? What do, what do you mean? And then when I opened the book, they was like, Dude, where did you get that? I need that book. And one guy on the spot was like 500 bucks. And I was like, nah, just got my hands on it. It's kind of a crapshoot. I can't wow. do it. You, you guys should have seen when, when me and Matt went and set up at the first Indiana <laughs> Comic Con. Um, I did. Yeah, John, you, you John did. did. <laughs> um, it, but all day long, I mean, all. all Every day of that show, you know, we, we had this huge display set up. We had a, a seven foot by 12 foot grid wall set up full of books and then three showcases on the table. And all weekend long, people were walking by and just watching them do a double take. Yeah. I mean, there, there was really no point during that show where there wasn't somebody at the booth that was talking to us, asking about, you know, what is this? Where'd you find it? You know, you know how did you find it? Right. Yeah. Did you go to those countries? Um, one guy, one hey, guy, Matt, do you have a picture of that setup? Uh, yeah, I can find one. You should show that. Keep, go ahead and keep talking, Tim. Let me find yeah. it. One, one guy was looking at uh, my Mexican House of Secrets that I had. I, cause I've got all the, the Adams and Wrights and covers. And he's wow. like, Well, you know, what, what's that worth? I said, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't care. It's not for sale. He's like, Well, you know, what if somebody offered you $20,000 for it? I said, I'd tell him it's not enough. It's not for sale. <laughs> he's like, Well, what if they $40,000? I said, it's not enough. You don't understand. It's not for sale. <laughs> people, people just, they, they can't grasp the concept sometimes in, in today's day and age of, you know, flipping books and, you know, everything has a price that there are certain things that you simply can't buy because you couldn't find another one. Right. Hey, I got a bail guys. Sorry, but uh, thanks for coming on. Awesome. Awesome. Looking forward to the feedback from this show. All right. All right. We will, we will cool. grudgingly trudge on without you, Paul. All right. Have a good night. It's good to see you, Paul. You too. See you guys. All right, Paul. Later. <clears throat> well, I mean, some of these books, some of them are, are resellable. You know, I, uh, you know, Spider Man 300, you know, you can find them. They exist. You'll find all of them you want, you know, in any country with the exception of, let's say, Filipino and probably one other. Um, so, so those are books you can buy, and you know, I'll get an undercopy, and I'll, I'll sell the undercopy because I've got a new one, a nicer one. But some of these ones that you guys are talking about, you may never see another. Yeah, totally. Especially depending on the country, like South African or Filipino, or even even stuff that we consider pretty easy to get, like European stuff. You know, grade could be a, a real concern. <clears throat> um, you might find another copy, but if you get rid of a really nice one. You might not ever find one that nice again. So, yeah, I might fly out to Mexico and take your ASM uh, three hundred nine six. <laughs> well, honestly, <Or> though, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I was going to say with my my research, I'm finding out that the uh, Hulk one eighty one homage or the cover swipes of that, those are starting to get up in price too. Like, oh I yeah, think I said the Brazilian one. I think that's the only thing that rivals that two two seven Batman. Do you, do you want a, do you want a tip on completing a Hulk 181 set? 
<laughs> yeah, what's the tip? Okay, so in Mexico, at the time that it was after Laprenza was out of business, Mac was gone. Novaro had the, the license to print some of the Marvel stuff for a little bit. They have one book that has the cover of 180, and the next issue has the cover of 182. 181 is split between those two issues. Wow. Yeah, it's weird. That's crazy. But do, do foreign collectors collect the cover or the story more? Or does it yeah, that's the next question. Most it guys seem to go after covers. Um, I... I don't know. I my my thought process on that is, you know, if even if that, <clears throat> that book exists as a backup story in, in another book and it doesn't have the cover, for a complete set, you still need that book. Yeah. If you if you consider it complete, see, and I'm I'm not quite there. I feel like uh, I'm not as concerned with necessarily the guts when I build my sets. Or what I'll do is I'll get I'll get the book that that's got the guts, but it'll be a, a low priority in comparison to the covers. Well, that, but that the, the perfect example of that is that Greek Iron Man, yeah, five cover. You know, it it is just the cover. The interior is Iron Man number three. Doesn't, yeah, doesn't have Thanos in it at all. If you want the Greek Iron Man fifty five, you need yeah. that Greek Spidey two thirty eight. Two thirty eight. Yep. Which is interesting because it's got two keys in it. This pasta and chicken. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that two thirty eight's really cool, and it, it's a small book. Um, how many, I, how many I have other that, books are examples that. of that with its two keys in one book? Oh, uh, um, it, it happens quite a bit actually. Just because they were pick, you know, whoever's printing them's like, we want the best stories. Let's just run them. Um. Who, well, like, and the Corno books from Italy are a good example of that because they, you know, they they'd have the main feature being, let's say, Captain America. Um, so they'll have they had some of the, the camp stuff from uh, Tales of Suspense in there. Like I think it's sixty four is in there. I don't think fifty eight and fifty nine are in there. But then the the backup story in that that book is X Men number one. Wow. Yeah, they, how they packaged it. Different publishers just kind of threw. Or sometimes they would do like, for instance, the, you know, the Death of Gwen Stacy storyline. So you'd have 121 and 122 in the book. <laughs> they might not have used 121's cover, but used um, 122. And then inside it's got 121 and 122 uh, Amazing Spider-Man. So you can have those instances. Um, one that's happened recently, that right off the top of the, my head, Tim, is that Greek Crow One that actually has. Doesn't it have the Caliber Presents um, as uh, well as Crow One through Three? I thought that's so. It was in essence, it was two it Crow did, yeah. keys. So that would be another example of a foreign book that, um, yeah, it basically had two keys in it. It had Caliber Presents. Number one, and it had Crow one through four in wow. it, I believe. Okay. Um, so it does happen, and it happens more often than not. But you're only going to know about it if you know about it, not if you're just going by covers, because you might not know what's in the interiors. So you gotta you gotta do your research again. Harping on what Robert had said, you gotta you know it, it's research, research, research. You're just sitting around. Looking on eBay, you're, a lot of the foreign stuff you're not going to find it. No matter how you type it in, yeah, you don't find it. You got you got to be researching it and know what you're looking for, and know what's special, and know what's out there. Um, and so it does. It, it's going to take newcomers a little bit of time. Um, but uh, getting back to what you had been asked, uh, Robert, you know about how you kind of as a newcomer got into it. You know the the right now the at least you know the the foreign collecting community pretty much everyone knows everyone else. It's a very small uh, yeah. community. At least at least the based on a lot of the you know the Western Hemisphere. Um, Definitely. So you know everyone is really cool. You can hit up anyone and ask them questions. Um, 
very often some of these guys that are, are, are in the niche also are in other foreign countries. Um, you know, there's big collectors in different countries that we know. Bjorn out of Sweden. Um, Andy, Robert, Andy out of Japan. And those guys are always willing to share knowledge or to help new guys come out. Um, it's and, just a um, matter of having the social skills to just reach out and say, hey, what can you tell me about this? Or this is my favorite book. What foreigns are out there about this? Yeah, um, like, well, um, and, and, I mean, Matt, I'm sure you, you, you'd be willing to attest to this. I mean, I'm, I'm generally accommodating when it comes to sharing information. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just not always readily available. <laughs> yeah, because Tim's always Tim's not always on Facebook. You know, in the early days, it was through the forums. You know, um, but now with social media, there's I mean, there's a large presence of uh, collectors on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I mean, you name it. Um, but all of that being said, if you are still looking for contacts in a country to maybe help get you foreign stuff, you might still have to go where those people are. And there are still plenty of foreign forums, foreign comic forums. In the early days, we used to have to go to the foreign comic forums, sign up, meet people, become friends, and have to say, hey, can you, do you think you can help me out? And that's how we got stuff out of really crazy places. Yeah, the Facebook group definitely helped with that. I can't say that it's more or less user-friendly. Like I said, it's just the communication skills to be able to relay yeah. what you're looking for. And knowing what what direction to be pointing to acquire some of the books, like even um Norman Robinson that's on Globo, yeah, Doc Scott. He put, yeah, he uh, <laughs> hey uh, John, he posted some books from uh the Tick. He had one from uh, oh, what I was didn't it? See that one? Yeah, he had three or four of them. One was German, one was French, and then I think the third one was like, oh, uh, what was it? It was like the Thailand one or something. And I was like. Wow, I went. I meant to tag you in it, but then I ended up getting a phone call and they took away the page. And I was going to tag you in it. Like, I don't think you've seen these, John. <laughs> I didn't even know they reprinted it elsewhere. Did they? Uh, what what cover did they use, Robert? Did they use the black cover? Polka no, dot? it was a diff. It was a different one. Like he he posted a couple of obscure books, and I was like, man, I know that one's probably hard. He even posted one that had a. Uh, it was from South. It was from uh, South Africa. And it was one where it had a black superhero that looked like Superman, but he had on like a yellow and green suit with the, you know, the, the SA on his chest. And I was like, where did you get that? And he was like, I bought this years ago, but I'll think I'll never find another one. And I was like, Oh, I think that's the one in Afrikaans or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the one. That is the like one. And I was like, Yeah. I even commented, and I was like, I'm pretty sure this is uh, virtually hard to find, I'm sure. There's and a cool he, article yeah. on that book online. Yeah. Somewhere. I'll have to find it. And then he had another one that was, uh, he had a He-Man Masters of the Universe one that was from, uh, what was it? it? Whatever it was, it looked like it was Greek, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't. But it was it was very hard. And I was like, I'm sure Sean Leggett doesn't have this one. Because <laughs> I was like, I know he had some obscure He-Man stuff, but I was like, I know that one he probably does not have. I, I think one of the other things you got to know when you're in this community is that if you get the opportunity to buy something that you've not seen you got to really, really try and say yes because you probably won't see it again. Will. Yeah, it's definitely is like like you said. You see the books you see now, you probably won't see them again, or it's gonna be very hard to find another. Yeah, you uh, got to always factor that in. And, that buyer you know, may yeah. go to somebody else next time and be like, if "They said yes, you said no." <laughs> That's yeah. true, and then you know, there's always there's a part of content management where sometimes you buy. If one of your sources in a foreign country has a book that you don't don't necessarily need but are cool, sometimes it's better to just buy them anyway. Because as you build those relationships with those foreign contacts and foreign sellers, um, it, it it tends to pay off later when they do find stuff that you need. Mm -hmm. I, and I've you know I my Filipino contact has been he's been able to find me stuff, and if if I can't buy it outright, I try everything I can to direct him to a buyer that will. And so he knows that coming to me, there's a good chance he's going to, he's going to uh, sell books. So when he, when he sends me stuff that's that I need, um, you know, I go crazy over it because I, I, I just, I need it. Well, I mean, like with the La Princes, you, you've uh, hooked me with a, a seller that 
He's sold the same book three times. And I say yes every time because I don't know when he's going to bring me the one that I do need. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how it is. So it's kind of, you know, again, that's a a factor that is a little different um, with this part of the hobby with foreigns. But out of all the groups. Go um, ahead. Go ahead. I was about to say, of all the groups of, of countries that's a part of the Facebook, the Facebook group and Globo, you have not one person in, Af- in Africa. It's almost like, wait, there's nobody willing no, to join these groups. They, they probably there just is? get hit by the spam filter. There is a oh, South okay. African guy. He's the guy, George. He's the guy that runs the South African super comic site. He now lives in the UK, but he grew up in South Africa. And uh, he, he is. So there is. Uh, okay. Yeah. And most most South African stuff, if you need to find it, there's a good chance that it made its way into America through George. His name's George Van. What's his last name, Tim? Uh, Vandery. Yeah, and that dude, that dude knows his shit when it comes. Think about this: the South African books are so rare. Even amongst the collectors there, there's still some people that don't think they know all of the output. Yeah. There's still some output that they that for even the old school guys that will pop up from super comics that they didn't realize existed. Uh, well, even uh, even before the super comic stuff, you know, you had the the, the mimosas. Yeah, the mimosas. Um, George, not zebra. Long ago, it was sometime last year, showed me some images of some. I think I think they were from mimosa. Um, it was uh, DC romance stuff from the late '60s, early '70s. You know that era that I. Loved. Oh yeah, and it was in Afrikaans. It was no, in Afrikaans. But, no, they, they, they were in English. Oh, were they? Yeah. Okay. But you know, I I'd love to get my hands on some of those. But he said that he's seen very few of them. So here's a, yeah. here's a question. I I don't think maybe Robert was asking it different, but are there other countries in Africa that were print reprinting any of this, or was it all South Africa? Uh, well, we know there is, uh, is it Zimbabwe, Tim? Yeah, no, I saw Zimbabwe. Uh, who's no, the Nigeria. Nigeria. So we know there was Nigeria. We also know that there was some Mundi Portuguese stuff that was sold in Africa. Um, because through colonialism, uh, there was, I forget which countries in Africa were kept by the Portuguese, but they they printed some books that had African pricing along with some of the other, um, you know, normal Brazil and Portugal and all that. But as far as I know, um, you got South Africa and Nigeria. And, you know, the Nigerian stuff just barely popped up. We didn't even know that shit existed until uh, but there's, a few there's years ago. Egypt, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then you got Egypt. Uh, Egypt. Don't some of them. We'll have some of the Arabic stuff. Don't some of them have Zimbabwe across the top of it too? I remember. I think that might that. be that might be those Mundi, um, those Portuguese. Zimbabwe okay. might have been the country that uh, Portugal. I don't know. I'm not sure on the colonial aspect of it. But um, the only ones that I know of that would be specific for their country were, like Tim said, the Egyptians the South Africans and the Nigerians. And there might be more out there, like I said, because the Nigerian books only popped up within the last like two years. And I'm sure at some point there was, there was stuff in Africa from the UK and France. Um, again, just, just because, you know, at one point, a lot of yeah, the colonialism. Out. Yeah. So. Well, I can say for the most part, that is definitely we can do that kind of fire to find some things because, you know, just some of the things I've acquired so far have been it, just crazy and mind boggling about these things that actually exist. It brings that, back an aspect of the hobby that's been missing for a lot of people since the internet came around and that's the thrill of the hunt. Yeah. Like I'm still into my variants. I still chase a few in American versions, but you know, sometimes those flips turn into, Oh man, cool. I could buy this Philippine, this Filipino, uh, Captain America book, like you know, I seen one that was in Japan. I have uh, Andy looking for it. There's a uh, Captain America 100 cover that has the Japanese letters going across the top of it. Yep. 
and that's definitely one I, I was like, man, I wouldn't mind getting my hands oh, on that. Oh, that's like the Kabuncha. Is it a Kabuncha, yeah. Tim? Uh, I believe so. So, so Robert, in your last three months, how much uh, effort and money have you spent on American books versus foreign? That number actually flipped. It's crazy because, you know, it wasn't to say it was a huge ratio already. My budget was always low. You know, I've always been a fan of keeping the budget low and, you know, go for the books I love versus, you know, trying to flip more. But I can say that the number of the money I've put into foreigns is about as equal I did to the American. So my budget uh -oh. American went lower. It's starting to yeah. happen. Yeah. Because well, the, the main thing to keep in mind, though, is, you know, if if you set a budget for yourself, stick to it. Don't don't spend outside your means. Uh, exactly. And buy stuff that, that you know you want, that, that you, you're going to enjoy, because then you don't regret having bought it. Right. So, I mean, you know, as you can see, the Black Panther thing is kind of the ones, book, the books I've been going for, because, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, does he exist outside the U.S.? Yes. And I thought maybe Africa had a version of it, but that was kind of a crap shoot to see if it even existed. But, you know, from the looks of it, you know, like you said, it was a B, it was a level B character versus an A character. So it's kind of hard to find those obscure books outside of the right. U.S. that were actually and, taken. And, and you have to look at you have to look at, at where those characters were popularity wise at the time they were being published, too. Exactly. Because, you know, I mean, years ago, no Thor wasn't as popular as he is now. Neither was Daredevil. <laughs> You know, they, they were they were kind of those those second tier characters. You know, yeah, they remember you know, Thor and Iron Man were members of the Avengers, but you know, their series didn't sell anywhere near as well as the Avengers did. Right. Like looking for those cover, like you know, when you talk about the sets, you know, like the Jack Kirby run, some of those books are kinda hard to find. Like you might find the uh what's the one, um uh, what is it? Like the New Gods. Like the New Gods, you might see that a couple of times. Like the yeah, Jack Kirby Black Panther, you see that a couple of times, but the Jungle Action one was printed more, so it's definitely a thing of you know just the research alone to see if a cover exists is kind of that yeah. you know I'm willing to pay thirty dollars to see if there's a scan that really exists to see if there really is one versus it's like the databases for me being new, the databases is kind of the thing of do these databases exist to even know that it, there is one versus chasing something that might be and that never existed to begin with. So I guess that's yeah, kind of that. There's a, saying, there's a saying, Robert, that we use all the time. You, 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 you can't collect what you don't know exists. And exactly. it is, it's the true. I mean, I mean, like, if you have to almost educate yourself in the beginning a little bit about what's out there before you, you can even necessarily pick a focus or – a set that you might want to build or, or whatnot. So it's, it, and I think that some of that is why maybe some collectors don't jump in. So, cause, cause it isn't easy and it does require a little bit of uh, more effort than necessarily would. So I wish there was a one place. I will say this grand comics database has gotten much better at connecting. See before in the early days, they might have a foreign scan, but they wouldn't have connected it through the story, through the database. They mm -hmm. wouldn't have connected it with the American issue. So okay. usually the first place that I go when I have a question about which foreigns um, got produced of a specific issue, I look on Grand Comics database first. And if you go, if you scroll down through their information, they're, they'll show you the other countries. That they're printed making an effort. And, and they are making a good effort in and, comparison. And, and I applaud their effort. But there are times, too, on there where they have the wrong information because I, I found a couple books where it's one of those cases where the cover feature does not match the interior, and they indexed it based on the cover feature. On the cover, yeah. Mm. Well, and a lot of the foreign books won't have any information at all. It's basically just the scan. Um, so it's not as good as a foreign database, of course, but it's kind of the first place you can look, uh, and it's in English, so... That would be a, a, a decent tip is check out GCD first and then from there branch out. So, okay. so Brian McClay just joined us and is curious so what Brian, the hell happened to his podcast. <laughs> he's he's on so many he gets confused, but he's like, I don't remember most of these guys. Yeah. What's up, Brian? Pick, pick the wrong day to jump in late. <laughs> What's up, man? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Right, good, good. How's how's everything? How's everybody doing? 
Good. Doing good. Good. We, we wore Paul out, and uh, the rest of the guys were worn out for, from Heroes Con. So we've been uh, jumping into the weeds on some foreign stuff. Well, I'm I'm just gonna sit back and uh, listen. So Did you find any more out it. there in the desert? No, man. Hell no. I wish this is uh this would be the perfect uh one to bust out the new gods one through five or something. <laughs> hey, you yes, found the one that you speaking of new gods though, Brian, show Robert that new gods you got. Oh, at Navarro. It'd be nice if I uh could just magically pick it out of all these <laughs> <comics>. <laughs> so yeah. I was I did. on the podcast. I saw it. I was uh I was lucky enough to find that new gods number one. Uh, not knowing what I had, so um, yeah, yeah that Mr. Book Miracle, book right? What's that? No, I was saying oh. you found the Mr. Miracle number one, too. Yeah, I was yeah. present with that broadcast. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Miracle number one, too. Yeah, very nice, very nice. I would think in the desert you guys would find a little more, but it's probably still a crapshoot. It's a crapshoot, but you, you can, depending on the city, you know, El Paso, Miami. Albuquerque, there's going to yeah. be more. There's a dealer I know up in Grand uh, Rapids, Michigan, that that uh, picked up some La Prenza keys from someone a couple of years ago. Um, but oh, through this area of the Midwest, there was a lot of migrant farm workers. That makes sense too. Huh. So it's it's not limited to, to just close to the border. Yeah, you never know. I mean, uh, I found a South African mimosa. Uh, Batman through my buddy Charles and he found it I think in Pueblo, Colorado and we were like how the hell did he get that? It was crazy Well, I um, that uh, that Epical Detective 400 too that I bought from somebody in Seattle Oh yeah, that those Epical Colombians are very rare books Navarro's um, Hey John I was yeah. wondering if we could uh because I really wanted Tim to talk about Filipinos. and discuss Yeah, I think we, we got about another 15 minutes or so. So if you want to end on Filipinos, I know that's the your, your passion at the moment of just the rarity and the obscurity. So it, it's They're fascinating. I don't know. Do, do you want to start first, Tim? Do you want to break uh, it down? It, go ahead and, you know, I, I'll follow your lead. Okay. Okay. Um, so well, you, the foreign community is obsessed with the Filipinos because they do seem to be the most rare of of most of these issues that people are hunting. From what I've from what I've gathered in my limited time, those books are thick. Will you um make me a presenter real quick, John? Yeah, yeah. I have, I have examples. We love some show and tell. That it helps the the audience. Yeah. Okay, so. The Filipino editions are kind of based around bookstores. And I'm not exactly sure why, but I think it's because I'm not sure. Just the bookstore culture there, they 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 got a lot of their literature and different stuff from from those bookstores. And there are three major ones. There's actually I think four, but you have <laughs> National Bookstore, Goodwill Bookstore. Alamar bookstore and then you had Universal bookstore which was later in the more modern era um, and there might have been even a few others um, they would have branches all over the island so you know the Philippines is, is, is an island um, and they have other smaller islands and, and others so they would have so National bookstore might have you know four big branches depending on the bigger cities and then the smaller cities might have little satellite stores. And what they did was they licensed both Marvel and DC books. And um, we think, Tim and I have talked about it. We think personally that there is a possibility that within some of those runs, um, there, there's actually issues that are just completely gone. So every, every example of them are just gone, destroyed or nowhere to be found anymore. And it's really based on... A couple different factors. We think that the print runs were pretty small. We think that environmentally, the Philippines is a very difficult place for paper. It's they have monsoons coming in. I mean, it, it, it's 100% humidity. Um, you know, 
GIs in World War II talked about, you know, getting foot rot, you know, out in the Pacific. I mean, just in your clothes and stuff. I mean, it's just so humid. So um, that combined with the fact that they really didn't, you know, a lot of the Filipino collectors preferred American books and they had access to American books. Uh, some of the bookstores actually sold American comics or you could go to one of the American bases and get American comics at, a, at the PX, um, you know, where the Mark Jewelers reprints were printed. So, you know, or I did I actually say reprint, I'm an addition. But um, so you had this kind of perfect storm that created this rarity from environment, print run, because we believe the print runs were very, very small, and then culture. And so you had the three different or the three major bookstores, Alamar, Goodwill and National Bookstore. Um, national bookstores, when they handled D.C. stuff, especially the stuff in, you know, in the Bronze Age that had the circles. They would strip out that information, the pricing information. And what they very often did was either they put a stamp on them or um, a price sticker or something. So. Sometimes with the Filipino books, when they're empty, when they have empty circles or they don't have um, a price on it. Here's an example of a national bookstore where you see like a price put into it. It's like a stamp. Um, here's another example of a D.C. national bookstore where they put in a stamp. And you usually see that same stamp, uh, sale and then P and then that says 175. And Tim, remind me what the currency is. The P stands for is it pes is it pesos they use? I don't remember. Uh, it's it, they call them pesos. Yeah, they're their own the peso. peso. But it's a Philippine peso, yeah. so it's different from a Mexican peso. So most of them come with a stamp because that's how they were sold. But the issues that don't have the stamp, I like to call them virgins. They haven't been touched. I know it's a sexual reference, but I like to call them virgins. And they, so when you when you when you get national bookstore, you like to find the ones that don't have anything on them. Um, that's my preference, at least. Um, Do you think, of, you think you think of the stamps or, or you know penciled in prices as, as defects, and I think of them as character? <laughs> yeah, here's another example of a stamp. You see it, and then it. Some of the stamps had this weird circular thing that was going on with it. I'm not exactly sure what that is. And then here's here's an example of one that that didn't have anything. So when they did Marvel, kind of like with DC, they just left it blank and they'd leave the the issue number in it. Now oh, back the book up a little bit. Is it the saber tooth one? No, 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 no. Oh no, no. okay. <laughs> Though, if the saber tooth, I don't know. I think the saber tooth one could exist, but I've never seen it. Have, have you ever seen that one, Tim? No. Yeah, I mean, it's possible, but I've never seen it. Um, I'd say Marvel key wise, this is probably for Ooh, National Phoenix Bookstore one, one of wow. the one of the the nicer ones that I have. Um, you know, one hundred and one is a cool book, especially. I mean, I wish the movie hadn't sucked so bad, but um, this is a. This is a really huge Filipino key. Also, wow. on the Marvels, where normally they'd have barcode here, that gets stripped out as well. How much that cost you? <laughs> um, this came with a gr that group that we were talking about earlier. That Tim said was uh, it was like I, I Tim and I both pitched in on it was like fifty books, Tim. Something like that. And that that brings me to another story. So. <laughs> The Philip, the first American, we knew the first guy that was on the ground there that knew what these books were and appreciated them, and uh, he was he was doing everything from putting ads in local newspapers to going to the different comic shows. Uh, his wife was a comic dealer down there, and guess what? All they're dealing in is is in American and manga and Japanese and manga and Korean manga and stuff. Their own local uh, bookstore books. They don't, for the most part, they didn't. They didn't really care for them. Um, in fact, that same guy was there for the Asia Comic Con, one of the largest Comic Cons in that part of Asia. Mm -hmm. And um, we asked him. We said, "Well, make sure to look for, you know, bookstore books 
any bookstore books, any Tagalog reprints, any of that stuff, he did not find a single bookstore Filipino at all in the entire con. And he looked. And he asked dealers, too. So that just kind of gives you an example of how rare these books are, even in their country of origin. Now, you get lucky when you find these books here in America. That tends to happen. Um, and the reason that you, you can't find them here in America is because we think a lot of American servicemen that were stationed over there probably picked them up and just threw them into their collections. This is a book that I bought from Tim, and he was able to pull two of these out of America. And the American ones, the ones that are here um, that escaped the island, tend to be in nicer conditions because if they were with Americans, the whole bag and board culture permeated throughout and they escaped well, the... The difference in humidity. In humidity alone. But, you know, this is probably one of my biggest DC keys. And this is not National Bookstore. This is Goodwill. So we talked about National earlier. Goodwill Bookstore was different. And not only did they strip things out, they even stripped the numbering out. Um, so they're not all the same. They're different, different, identified differently. Yes, they are. Because Goodwill numbered them in a different way. So here's a Marvel okay. Goodwill. And you'll notice the Marvel Goodwill stuff. You're going to have to tilt that a bit. Yeah. There we there go. go. The Marvel Goodwill stuff did this weird numbering. And Tim, will you explain that? Because I, I've still not figured out how to explain it properly. It is, uh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> and that's, it, it's a little tricky. It's, it's based on the release date. Um, me, me and Doc, actually, we're looking at it and... Because keep in mind, outside the U.S., they don't they don't structure writing the dates the same way we do. We do month, day, then year. They do it by year, month, and then day. Um, and the the stamps on those it, it it coincides with about when those books should have been released. And it's, it seems to be fairly consistent with with all the ones that. That we've seen, so it's so it, seventy five. It's, 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 it's essentially it's a date stamp. Oh three seventy five. This one here would have been seventy two, right? Yeah. Yep. And the goodwill, for some reason, seemed to be harder to find, and I'm not exactly sure why. Um, I think it's because the goodwill was doing them first. And the National Bookstore jumped on kind of uh, the printing bandwagon for, for DC and Marvel. We've sometimes wondered if there was a possibility of a, of a Marvel book being printed by both. But I, I have yet to see that. Um, and then, okay, so that was Goodwill. The, the print runs may numbering. very well have been smaller on the Goodwills, too. Yeah, they may very may well have. Because if you, you know think about it. We're not talking about a print run for like America where you're printing in the millions for every state. The Philippines is still a relatively small island and you're only printing them for the different bookstores. So for that month, you're printing some of that issue for your bookstores, which you might have four major stores and then maybe 10 little satellite stores. Now, what we've been told by Filipino collectors is that you could find the bookstore editions not in the bookstore. You can actually find them on the stands. So we don't know if maybe the printers were printing these runs and then, you know, as, as it goes in third world countries, people make money in every way they can. And then maybe they were, maybe they were, had a little side job selling them to the, the, the newsstand people, you know, the overruns they sold to the newsstand people. So maybe you could pick them up there. But either way, it's not like these were getting printed in anywhere near like what print runs were in Europe or South America, or America. No. Um, they had to have been teeny tiny. I, I, I think at their height, National Bookstore, at that point in time, had five locations. And I, I, I can't imagine, you know, with, with the economy in the Philippines, that they were selling more than maybe 500 copies per location on a monthly basis. 
And that's wow. not going to be every title either. So, I mean, print runs on some of these might be literally a couple thousand issues. What book is that? This one is the uh, World's Finest 211. You got to remember most of the keys weren't keys when they were printed. They were just random luck. Yeah, it's whatever, whatever the bookstore decided they were going to print that month. So yeah, that Phoenix, a lot so the X. Oh, go ahead, go ahead Robert. Robert. We've seen come out of there that, that we would consider keys. You know, you, you saw Matt's X Men 101. He's got the Star Wars one. Um, this one's a key. I've got. He's got I've the got weird the Western. All Star Western 11 that, that Glenn yeah, was. Yeah, All Star Western find. 11, yeah. We still don't know if the 10 was printed, if, if it exists at all. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's very random. There's no rhyme or reason to how anything pops up. It's. And these books have the guts that matches the cover. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The page so the X-Men 101 is usually different because they don't have the same ad pages that the American books do. Yeah. The star Wars. That's nice. And this is an Alamo. So that's the other group. Yeah, this this is this is the Alamo. You know, well, there could feasibly be three Filipino Star Wars ones. There could, but I really don't think that. No, if Goodwill, Goodwill and National had done it, it would have popped up by now. I think. No, Goodwill and National had had stopped printing by the time Alamo started. Yeah, oh, okay. seventy seven, late seventies. Um, yeah, so Alamo is a whole nother story. Um, they're even kind. Of, they're even smaller, as far as I know and I've heard. I think they're an even smaller bookstore than either Goodwill or um, National. And um, Ron Rickard could go into this in more detail, but we think that Alamar was connected with some kind of pizza shop down there, because, <laughs> because most of the there have been some Star Wars ones that have come out of there that Ron has found that have like this sticker um, talking about. Um, like a pizza joint or something. That um, might so be we're, an emotional thing too. Maybe the yeah. guy that didn't sell any, any return copies, you know, they picked up to use as a promotion. Yeah, for a pizza joint. So we've seen them with this pizza joint sticker and without. But the Alamars have these weird, funky uh, little advertisements in them with some kids that are drawn really ugly. I wish I had examples. <laughs> <laughs> They're just the, like the ugliest little kids are selling these Alamar, these Alamar ads. They're like Alamar house ads, and they're just they're freaky. I don't have examples, unfortunately, but um, yeah. So, so those are your three major bookstores: um, Alamar, Goodwill, and National. Um, there was also a, a run, the Atlas reprints, or they call them reprints, but the the Atlas editions. You have a Spider-Man 300 in there. Um, I think there's a 301. Um, and that wasn't through... That was an actual publisher. It wasn't through the bookstore. And um, I don't have an exam... I didn't have time to pick up my, my 300 copy. Um, but the bookstore books are amazing, man. And for the longest time, too, a lot of these bookstore books were hiding out here in America... But people really didn't know what they were. No, somebody just posted on Facebook while well, they found a, a Richard Dragon one, and they, they just stuck out because, like, well, there's no price. Oh yeah, yeah. And so if you don't, you know, it could be just in 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 back issue boxes somewhere. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know what you're looking at. I mean, there were even some national bookstores that didn't strip out the information. And the cover looks exactly the same, and you wouldn't realize that it wasn't one until you pulled it out and saw the back. Um, let me see if I can find that one real quick. Um, Tim, go ahead and talk some more. While I look. <laughs> uh, well, I want. Yeah, well, and the, I mean, the the Philippines in general is just it, it's an interesting place as far as the publishing because. Later on in the 90s, they did some Valiant stuff, which talking to Bob Layton and Jim Shooter, both of them say that was not licensed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so what, it was bootleg. Oh, yeah. yeah I uh, passed, I procrastinated because MCS had some of it up and I didn't buy any. Yeah. Um, 
but those, I mean, those books are, I mean, even the covers are, are newsprint on them. It's not, it's not a high quality production of any kind. Yeah. Um, those are the, the Tagalog MKPIs. Yeah. And they, you know, there was, there was some Marvel stuff that was done over there at the same time. Um, and it, th that stuff, you just don't see it in decent shape, even though it's, you know, decades newer than the bookstore editions because, you know, the climate there just sucks. Um, and they, that, that bias against the stuff printed there never seems to have gone away. They, they don't seem to have had an appreciation for anything that was actually produced there. I know Tony was working on a deal with one guy for a stack of bookstores a couple of years ago. And the guy ended up having to back out of the deal because the family was moving, which is why the guy was selling the books. And his mom disassembled the books to use the paper to wrap her silverware. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's a horrible, horrible story. Oh, I was in here. I'm trying to let entire Tim entire find it, but I think we're going to have to wrap up pretty soon because some of us well, are East Coast. Well, yeah, it's yeah. getting late, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, one thing well, I'll I'll say about I'll find it for, we'll talk more about Filipino books another time. So I want to thank uh, thank the guests. I know uh, my usual team is is uh, out. Thanks, Brian and uh, Paul, for showing up. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt from uh, Foreign Comic Collecting uh, Magazine. Thanks, Tim from CBCS. Thank Robert from our own group and everywhere else he's been. We've hung out with him before in uh, Baltimore. Um, and uh, as always, if you want to learn more, come uh, come check out uh, the Facebook group with uh, Foreign Comic Collecting. And uh, yeah, just you know. hit any one of these guys up. We'll, you know, if you're interested, we'll help you out, just like we helped Robert. And now look at him; he's going like gangbusters. Absolutely. And then for your uh, general comic needs and your comic spec, check out uh, comicbookinvest.com or uh, the uh, MeWe page or the Facebook page, Comic Speculation Investing. Uh, um, group and uh, we'll see y'all next week. I know the guys are coming back. We're going to talk some Heroes Con. I'm sure there will be some uh, terrible stories and some great stories. So uh, <laughs> thanks everyone. We'll uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks guys. Have All a good right. one.